Well, thank you very much for the very kind introduction. I'm delighted to be here and <clears throat> to present uh, uh, the book that I released yesterday. The book is focusing on the journey of humanity, namely the evolution of human societies since the emergence of anatomically modern human in Africa nearly 300,000 years ago. And in fact, it focuses on two fundamental mysteries that surrounds this journey. The mystery of growth, namely what are the roots of the dramatic transformation in living standards in the past two centuries after hundreds of thousands of years of stagnation, and the mystery of inequality, namely what is the origin of the vast inequality in the standard of living across countries and regions of the world. Over most of human existence, human life was largely nasty, brutish, and short. Like any other species, humans were largely preoccupied with survival and reproduction. Living standards were very close to the subsistence level, and there were minor differences in living standards across time and across space. In fact, a few centuries ago, one fourth of newborn did not reach their first birthday, and one half of them did not reach their reproductive age. Numerous women perished during childbirth. Life expectancy fluctuated in a very narrow range of 25 to 40 and rarely exceeded 40. Most people rarely ventured from the remote birth place over their lifetime. They were largely illiterate and they lived in the darkness after the disappearance of the sun over the horizon. And perhaps more strikingly, an economic crisis during this period did not lead into bell tightening, it led to mass starvation and extinction. But then something very dramatic occurred in the past 200 years a metamorphosis. Dramatic transformation in living standards across and within societies. Think of the capita in the world as a whole within this 200 year period is increasing by a factor of 14. Life expectancy has more than doubled, and there is a great divergence in income per capita across countries and regions of the world. Now, to illustrate this dramatic transformation, consider for a moment residents of Jerusalem at the time of Jesus, residents of Jerusalem at the time of the, of the Romans. So this is nearly 2,000 years ago. And with this individual forward in a time machine to the Ottoman period, Jerusalem in the 19th century. Despite this 2,000 year jump, these individuals will be able to instantaneously adapt to the new environment. Past knowledge would be largely applicable. Technological improvements would be merely incremental. Occupations would require very similar skills, and life expectancy would remain unchanged, and as a result of it, would not necessitate a change in the mindset of individuals. But now, consider these individuals, and with them, yet again, but only 200 years forward, from Ottoman Jerusalem in the 19th century to contemporary Jerusalem in the 21st century. Despite this minor jump in terms of the time period, this will be a devastating experience, a shocking experience. Past knowledge would be largely obsolete. Modern technologies would appear literally as a witchcraft. Occupations would require incomprehensible skills <coughs> and life expectancy would instantly double. And as a result of it would require a different type of orientation future-oriented orientation, education decisions, saving decisions, life cycle decisions. So in contrast to the conventional wisdom that exists in, in, in some sectors of, uh, of the economic discipline and beyond, in fact, living standards has not increased gradually in the course of human history. 
technological problems evolved gradually in the course of human history, but a negligible impact on the standard of living generated larger population, but not richer population. And in fact, the recent rise in, in, in living standard reflects what I will define as phase transition, namely an abrupt transformation once a certain tipping point has been reached. So to conceptualize this change, consider the evolution of income per capita in the past 2000 years. And what you see in front of you is a striking picture, namely economies are in a state of stagnation, Malthusian stagnation for most of the course of human history for the past literally hundreds of thousands of years. And then something very dramatic is occurring in the past 200 years. A dramatic spike in the income per, in income per capita in the world of the magnitude, as I said, of uh, 14 times. And in fact, some regions of the world are experiencing an increase in income per capita that is 100 times and others 50 times, but on average, 14 fold. Now, in fact, if I would take this diagram and I would remove the labeling of the axis and I would show this diagram to a random scientist, probably most people will say that this is the output of a seismograph that detects tectonic activities and eruption. But in fact, this is precisely the evolution of income per capita. Suddenly, we see this eruption. And this is, to a large extent, what I will define and what I define in the book as the mystery of growth. Now, at the same time, this takeoff does not occur at the same time across the globe. Some societies are experiencing this takeoff as early as the beginning of the 19th century and even earlier and others only recently. And as a result of it, we see this great divergence in income per capita that is occurring in the past uh, two centuries. <laughs> Western Europe and Western offshoots are taking off first, other regions of the world are lagging behind, and there is a huge gap that is emerging in the world economy. Now, naturally, if we would like to understand and to resolve these two fundamental mysteries, the mystery of growth and the mystery of inequality, we have to develop a better identification of the forces that permitted the transition from stagnation to growth. We have to develop a better identification of the forces that brought about the differential timing of the transition across the globe. And we have to understand the role of historical and prehistorical processes that contributed to this differential timing of the transition across the globe. And naturally, if in fact we can resolve these two mysteries, we will be in a better position to design strategies to mitigate inequality across the globe. So in order to resolve these two mysteries, the book initially marches forward in time from the time of the emergence of anatomically modern human in Africa, 300,000 years ago, to the present. And the underlying conviction is that this march forward holds the secret for the mystery of growth and ultimately the mystery of inequality, namely, when we are about to resolve the mystery of inequality, we will have to be in a better position to understand the role of deep-rooted factors in comparative development today. Namely, how events that occurred hundreds of years ago, thousands of years ago, and even tens of thousands of years ago are lingering and affecting comparative economic development today. And consequently, we focus on phases of development. And when you think about phases of development, one can identify three fundamental phases of development. Malthusian epoch, the post Malthusian regime, and the modern growth regime in which uh, the people in this room are residing. Now, the Malthusian epoch originates with the emergence of anatomically modern human in Africa nearly 300,000 years ago. And it spans 99.9% .9 of human existence, plus still about the eve of industrialization in the context of the most developed societies in the world. And the Malthusian epoch is characterized by 
interesting dualism. On the one hand, stagnation in living standards, but on the other hand, great dynamism in technology, population, and human adaptation that ultimately permits the takeoff from stagnation to growth. So over this 300,000 year period, these processes are ultimately leading into the takeoff from stagnation to growth. They're leading initially into the post-Malthusian regime. And then the onset of the demographic transition is freeing the growth process from the counterbalancing effect of population and the world is sailing into the modern growth regime. So given the importance of the Malthusian epoch in the understanding of contemporary inequality, why some countries are rich and others are poor, let me try to identify the three fundamental winds of change that are governing the process of development and are orchestr orchestrating this transition from stagnation. So as I said, the Malthusian epoch is characterized by important dualism, stagnation along with dynamism. Stagnation in living standards in the sense that income per capita fluctuates around the subsistence level and life expectancy fluctuated in a narrow range of 25 to 40. But dynamism in the context of technology, in the context of population, and in the context of human adaptation. Now, at any point in time, what I refer to the dynamism is very, very slow and very, very low. Namely, we see slow rate of technological progress, slow rate of population growth, and slow rate of adaptation. But over a 300,000 year period, this process gains momentum up to a point in which, in fact, these three forces are generating the transition from stagnation. So the first building block in these winds of change is the impact of technology on population. And during the Malthusian epoch, technological progress naturally generated an increase in income. But this was not long lasting. Why? Because again, if people adopted better fertilizers, better uh, uh, technology, better plows, they had largely larger output than before. But this output permitted more of the offspring to survive. It permitted more offspring to be born and consequently population grew and ultimately income reverted back to the previous equilibrium position. Over most of human history, technological progress was converted into more people rather than into richer people. So broadly speaking, technologically advanced societies or land-rich economies had higher population density, but largely similar level of income per capita. And the evidence is striking with this in this respect. Look at the relationship between land productivity, okay, as you can see here, and population density along the vertical axis. You can see this pronounced positive association. More fertile uh, land is generating higher population density. And the same would hold for the relationship between technology and population density. But the striking element is that there is no association between land productivity and technology and income per capita. As I said, richer, I mean, societies that are richer in land, societies that have more advanced technologies have larger population density but very similar levels of income. The second important building block or wheel of change is the impact of technological progress on human adaptation. So naturally, as I just argued, the Malthusian pressure affected the size of the population. But in addition, it affected the composition of the population. And why is it so? Naturally, traits that were complementary to the growth process tautologically generated higher income. But in the Malthusian world, higher income was converted into higher reproductive success. And consequently, these traits that were complementary to the growth process became more and more prevalent in the population over time. And this adaptation raised the prevalence of complementary traits to the growth process and reinforced the process and ultimately reinforced the takeoff from stagnation to growth. 
So this is the second wheel of change that we will focus. And the third one is in fact, the forces behind technological progress. And here, the argument is very simple. The size of the population and the composition of the population affects technological progress. Why is it so? Because the size of the population affects the number of innovators, namely the supply of innovations. The size of the population affects the number of individuals that may use the technology and therefore the demand for innovation. It affects the diffusion of knowledge, it affects the division of labor, and it affects the extent of trade. And all these forces are contributing to, uh, uh, to technological progress. So in the course of human history, what we can see is the following. Population size increases over time. The composition of the population is adapting and they're both affecting the rotation of the wheel of change that is technological progress. Technological progress becomes faster and faster and faster. And as technological progress becomes faster, the size of the human population gets larger and the adaptation gets larger. So we see these winds of change, reinforcement between population size and population composition and technological progress and the feedback from technological progress into uh, population size and adaptation. Now, over most of human history, this rotation is relatively slow and it doesn't necess necessitate an investment in human capital on the part of the population. But ultimately, we reach a point in which technological progress is so rapid, so as to require human capital in order to cope with this rapidly changing technological environment. So human capital becomes essential in navigating this stormy technological environment. Parents start to invest in the human capital of their children, but given the fact that they have limited resource constraints, they have to economize on the size of the population. This implies that the demographic transition is taking place, fertility starts to decline, the growth process is freeing from the counterbalancing effect of population, and the world is sailing into the modern growth regime. Now, as I said, this transition is what may be defined as a phase transition. So think about phase transition in nature, the transition from liquid to gas. Naturally, as we hit water and as the temperature increases, initially there is no change in the state of this, uh, uh, of this water molecules. But ultimately, as we reach a critical threshold, we see the evaporation of these water molecules and the transition from water to gas. Very similarly, in the course of human history, we see that there are certain latent forces that are operating below the, below, below the surface. And this is basically the rate of technological progress and its impact on the latent demand for human capital. But since technological progress initially is so slow, we move from one strong technology to another one, it doesn't require any human capital. The increase in the demand for human capital is very small, and as a result of it, we do not see an investment. But ultimately, after 300,000 year period, when we move from stone tool technology to steam engine technology, a change is being made. And then we see this dramatic eruption, namely a phase transition that allows us to move from uh, a stagnation and from the agricultural state of development to the industrial stage of development. So what we see behind mathematically is the concept of bifurcation. Namely, we are living in a particular state in terms of, uh, 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 in terms of economic development, and then suddenly the Malthusian equilibrium simply vanishes and we are gravitated into the modern growth regimes. Now, when we think about the march of humanity, broadly speaking, it appears that the march of humanity to a large extent has been unstoppable. In what sense? If we think about shattering and dreadful events in the course of human history, World War I, World War II, the Spanish flu, the Great Depression, and most recently COVID-19, for people who live through these crises, this appear devastating and perhaps uh, uh, insurmountable. 
But what history teaches us is that, in fact, many of these forces, dramatic and devastating as they were, had limited impact on the grand arc of human development. Humanity recovered from these uh, tragedies with great haste and continued its march forward. Now, naturally, at the moment, we are all facing, uh, and some of us naturally more than others, this humanitarian crisis that, uh, that is uh, uh, developing in, uh, in Ukraine. And again, this is devastating. And if we think about the Ukrainian people, they will live with this, uh, the aftermath of, and the consequences of these atrocities for the next decades and perhaps beyond. But at the same time, history suggests that the gloom that is sort of surrounding us these days is perhaps uh, not necessarily in place in the sense that history suggests that it is very unlikely that this event and similar events will derail humanity from its relentless march forward. So in this respect, as you will see when you read the journey of humanity, the journey of humanity is, is, is providing a very hopeful outlook in these gloomy days about the future of humanity. Nevertheless, you may ask yourself whether climate change will be the single most devastating event that will ultimately derail humanity from its relentless march. And here, too, the journey of humanity, both the book and the actual journey, provides very hopeful uh, outlook. In what sense? It suggests to us that technological acceleration that existed in, in the course of human history is, in fact, the catalyst of climatic change. It is technological acceleration that brought about industrialization industrial pollution, and started the process of climate change. But at the same time, it is this technological acceleration that brought about human capital formation, the power of innovation, and as we experience in the context of COVID-19, this power of innovation is so incredible that it was able to terminate a major pandemic in a relatively short period of time. So in the context of global warming, given the fact that this technological acceleration increased the power of innovation and at the same time brought about a decline in fertility rates, even India is now just touching replacement level in fertility, this suggests to us that these processes are bound to first mitigate the pace of climatic change, but most importantly, provide scientists with the needed time to develop these revolutionary technologies that can, in fact, reverse the current pattern that we see across the globe and ultimately turn this crisis, hopefully, into a fading memory. So as I said, when you read the book, you will notice that the first part of the book is marching forward, starting in Africa 300,000 years ago and moving to the present. And in this course of the first part of the book, the mystery of growth is resolved. But nevertheless, we remain with the mystery of inequality. Namely, what are the roots of the vast inequality in income per capita as we see it today? So the second part of the book is in fact taking the opposite course of direction in terms of time. Namely, starting at the present and marching gradually backward in human history peeling gradually different layers of influence, initially institutions, culture, geography, Neolithic revolution, and back to Africa at the time of the exodus of humans 60 to 90,000 years ago. And basically providing us with essential tools to understand the roots of inequality, and consequently providing us with the tools to design policies that could mitigate inequality today. Now, naturally, when we look at the uneven development across the globe, it is very tempting to attribute it superficially to differences in education, differences in physical capital formation, and differences in technological level, the proximate causes. Yes, of course, they're, they're correlated with them, but the question that emerges is why some societies fail to invest efficiently in physical and human capital formation? Why some societies fail to adopt advanced technologies. And this leads us 
into the understanding that since much of the inequality that we see across the globe today was originated in the past 200 years due to the differential timing of the transition from stagnation to growth. And since this differential timing reflects forces that existed in the distant past, we must focus on deeper layers of influence. So this thing takes us into the deeper roots of, um, of what I will call historical and prehistorical barriers to development. Initially, institutional and cultural characteristics, and finally, the ultimate roots, namely geography and human characteristics. So let's start with the fingerprints of institutions. Naturally, what we see in the course of human history is the emergence of differential institutions across the globe. We see the emergence of growth enhancing, inclusive institutions in some societies, and we see the emergence of growth retarding extractive institutions in others. But yet again, institutions are rarely manna from heaven. The question is, why do we see this differential adoption of institutions in different corners across the globe? So admittedly, there are some critical junctures in which differential institutions are emerging quite randomly. We can think, for instance, about the impact of the Black Death on the decimation of the European population, 40% decline in population, scarcity of labor, and consequently competition of the, over the labor force that is leading into the decline of feudalism, the emergence of property rights, and ultimately, uh, per perhaps industrialization in England. We can consider, for instance, the Glorious Revolution and its impact on the emergence of constitutional monarchy in England and ultimately the emergence of industrialization. Or perhaps most strikingly, we can consider the division of the Korean Peninsula along the 38th parallel that is naturally generating a, a, a northern hell and a southern paradise. So certainly we can consider a counterfactual history in which the, the Korean Peninsula would not have been divided along the 38th parallel and segments of the society in Korea would have enjoyed different level of income per capita as we see it today. Or we can consider the possibility that James II would have defeated William of Orange in the battlefield, the glorious revolution would not take place, absolute monarchism will remain in England, and in fact, England would even revert to Catholicism, in which case perhaps industrialization would have occurred in Holland rather than in England. Yes, so there are some critical junctures, but we can name them perhaps on, uh, with, on, on one hand, perhaps on two. Largely speaking, institutions has mostly evolved gradually in response to economic development. And in particular, the transition into the Neolithic Revolution, namely the emergence of agriculture nearly 12,000 years ago, is associated with tremendous increase in population density. And this tremendous increase in population density naturally generates demand for institutions that can generate cooperation across individuals, that can facilitate the introduction of necessary public goods and can generate social cohesiveness broadly speaking. Or we can think about other geographical characteristics, the suitability of the soil for large plantations. Naturally, the suitability of the soil for large plantation led gradually into the emergence of large concentration of land ownership and ultimately into the emergence of extractive institutions and even slavery. And we can consider the disease environment. The disease environment was a hurdle in the process of development and a hurdle in the process and the adoption of centralized institutions. So as I said, mostly in the course of human history, we see that institutions are responding to economic development. And this implies that if we want to understand the roots of inequality today, we have to peel the layer of institutions and to look deeper. And this brings us into what I will define as the cultural factor. So again, in the context of culture, we see the emergence of differential cultural traits across the globe. 
We see the emergence of growth enhancing cultural traits such as social capital in some regions of the world. We see the emergence of growth retarding cultural traits, for instance, family ties in other regions. And in fact, many have attributed the Italian divide, the northern southern divide in Italy to the presence of social capital in the north and family ties in the south. But again, cultural traits are rarely manna from heaven. So why do we see social capital in northern Italy and family ties in southern Italy? So in the, again, admittedly, there are some critical juncture in which cultural mutation emerge. And as a result of it, we see an inertia that it is persisting over time. And perhaps the best case in point is in the context of Judaism and basically mandatory literacy that is imposed in the first century without any economic justification. In fact, it's a great economic liability at the time. But ultimately, as economies are developing and human capital becomes very important in the production process, this random mutation becomes very, uh, uh, very beneficial. We can think about the Protestant Reformation, not necessarily in the context of random mutation, because naturally the Protestant Reformation reflects some political and uh, religious competition at the time. Uh, but naturally the Protestant Reformation, the emphasis on thrift and entrepreneurship has a tremendous impact on the spirit of capitalism and the transition from stagnation to growth. But as I said, culture, in the course of human history, largely adapted to the geographical environment, the technological environment, the economic environment. So naturally, the rise in the return to human capital changed the attitude towards investment in, in children, in, in investment in education. The agricultural return to, uh, uh, to, to uh, different yields in different societies induce certain investment in, uh, in agriculture and taught people how to delay gratification and was behind the emergence of future-oriented mindsets. Climatic volatility affected the degree of loss aversion in society and as a result of it, entrepreneurial spirit. And lastly, the suitability of the land for the use of the plow affected the adoption of the plow and consequently provided comparative advantage for men in agricultural production and generated persistent gender bias that affects labor force participation even today. So again, if we think about the cultural factor, it appears that there are geographical element behind it, human element behind it, technological elements behind it. So we need to move into the deeper layer of inference, which is basically the shadow of geography. If we think about geographical characteristics, soil quality, climate, the disease environment or isolation, naturally they had a direct, or they do have direct impact on economic development. They affect labor productivity, they affect human capital formation, they affect trade, and they affect technological progress. But in addition, they have an indirect effect, as I just argued, on the evolution of cultural and institutional characteristics. So naturally, these are deep-rooted factors, ultimate factors that we would expect to have a tremendous effect on the contemporary level of inequality across society. Now, focusing on geography leads us further back in the course of human history into the onset of the Neolithic Revolution 12,000 years ago. So as you know, at a certain point in human history, we see this transition from hunter-gatherer tribes to agricultural communities. And this transition is generating certain surpluses that permits the emergence of a non-food producing class. Why is it so important? Because this non-food producing class is associated ultimately with knowledge creation, in the form of science, in the form of technology, and in the form of written languages. And it generates a technological head start that persists over time. So variations in the timing of the onset of the Neolithic revolution across the globe that can be mapped into certain geographical endowments could be the origin of some of the variations in income per capita across the globe. This is in fact, 
the diamond hypothesis. Now, empirically, what we know at the moment is that, in fact, the diamond hypothesis is relevant for the understanding of comparative development till about the year 1500. In the post-1500 period, in fact, the entire argument is mute. And the reason is that the transition to the Neolithic was associated with two elements. The one that was emphasized by Diamond, nam namely technological head start, but the second one is comparative advantage in agriculture. And com comparative advantage in agriculture, as we know, has limited technological spillovers. And as we moved into the modern world in which industry and the urban sector were in fact the hub for technological innovations, those societies that had comparative advantage in agriculture started to lag behind and these two forces started to offset one another. So as I said, revealing deeper and deeper layers of influence are taking us with the diamond hypothesis 12,000 years back. But in fact, we think deeper, we can go back all the way to Africa. And this leads us into the out of Africa hypothesis of comparative development. As you know, Humans are departing from Africa nearly 60 to 90,000 years ago. And we are all offsprings of this migration, no exceptions. And naturally, this migration is affecting the distribution of population diversity, as I will show you momentarily, and consequently, comparative economic development across the globe. So during this exodus of modern human from Africa, departing populations are carrying with themselves only a subset of the diversity that existed in the original population, whether it is cultural diversity, phenotypic diversity, behavioral diversity, or linguistic diversity. And why is it so? Because the original population is rather small, the departing population is rather small, and we are sampling from a limited distribution, and the sample is not representative sample. Some of the diversity that existed initially evaporates in this process. Now, in addition, the process, the migration process is sequential, and as a result of it, each step that humans are making out of Africa is reducing the degree of diversity further and further. So the further an indigenous population is from Africa, the less diverse it is. And this is a good illustration of the argument. If we start with the population in Africa, and this is the level of diversity that exists initially, and humans are de departing initially into the area of the Fertile Crescent, then those, population, those individuals that are departing are not carrying the entire diversity that existed in the African population. Now, this population will settle in the Fertile Crescent, will grow ultimately, and ultimately will be forced to migrate in a search for more fertile land. They will move into Central Asia, into the Bering Strait, and into the Americas. As they take each additional step, in fact, the population becomes more and more homogeneous. And the data is striking in this respect. If you look at migratory distance from Africa in 10,000 kilometers, and those societies that are about 25,000 kilometers from Africa in migratory distance are the least diverse in the world. The African population is the most diverse, followed by the Middle Eastern population, the European population, the Asian population, the Oceanian population, and Native Americans. And this will be true regardless of how you measure diversity, okay? Any measure of diversity will provide you precisely with this pattern. Now, why is it so important? It is so important because diversity has conflicting effects on productivity. On the one hand, it has beneficial effects on creativity and innovations because diversity permits cross-fertilization of ideas and complementarities in the production process. But on the other hand, diversity affects social cohesiveness. Generate mistrust, it generates disagreement about the desirable public goods, and consequently, it generates conflict. So, given the fact that there are two conflicting effects, if in fact each of these effects has positive and diminishing effects on diversity, then we should expect to find a hump shaped relationship between diversity and development. 
And the evidence are striking in this respect. Look at panel A. This is population density in the year 1500. Hump-shaped relationship between diversity and economic development today, based on migratory distance from Africa 60 to 90,000 years ago. And the countries that are residing here at the peak of the hump are Korea, Japan, and, uh, and China. Naturally, not countries that appear to us very diverse, but this is a different time period in which diversity is less important because technology is not evolving very rapidly and innovations are less important than social cohesiveness. But as we move into the modern period, in fact, the hump should remain, but the peak of the hump is associated with the society of the United States. Namely, the level of diversity that is optimal for development is increasing in the context of development. And this will be true if we focus on urbanization rates and uh, luminosity uh, in the contemporary period. Now, alternatively, you can focus on ethnic groups rather than countries. And if you focus, in fact, on all the ethnic groups in the ethnographic atlas, 1,265 ethnic groups, you will see that in every 1,000 years, starting with 1,000 BCE, 12,000 years ago, we see this pronounced hump-shaped relationship between migratory distance from Africa and economic development. So back to the wheels of change. As I said before, the size of the population, the composition of the population, and technological progress are the wheels of change. They are orchestrating ultimately the transition from stagnation to growth. But the pace of this rotation is not independent of other forces. The pace is a function of institutional factors and cultural factors. And of course, they are affected by geography and migratory distance from Africa. And consequently, in the course of human history, societies that were fortunate enough to reside in places where the geographical endowment or the migratory distance from Africa was an optimal one, took off much earlier than others, and a divergence occurred across the globe. Now, if you ask yourself about the roots of comparative development, it is quite apparent that nearly 90% of the variations of income per capita today can be traced to deep-rooted factors. The migration of humans out of Africa accounts for about 17 to 26% of the unexplained variations in, uh, in uh, inequality. The time since human settlement and the Neolithic revolution explain about 3%, mostly the time since human settlement. Geographical and climatic factors, a huge component, 27 to 38%. The disease ecology, 10 to 15%, cultural factors, about 20%, and political institutions such as executive constraint and polity four, the democracy index, explain about three to 9%. So there are many factors that affect comparative development. And as I said, the second part of the book is stepping backward and trying to identify each of them at a time and reaching this conclusion about the relative magnitude of these factors. Naturally, all these factors are important and they're important for the understanding of the world. Now, as you know, when Malthus was engaged in the writing of his uh, 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 dismal predictions about the future of the world, people attributed is right, attributed to the economic science, the, the, the name, the dismal science. And the reason was that Malthus was associated with dismal prediction about the fact that humanity is doomed. And in fact, we will not be able to escape from the arms of the Malthusian octopus. Now, does it what I do here, does it imply that, in fact, the fate of nation is written in stone and, in fact, there is geographical and historical determinism? Not at all. Precisely the opposite. The insights from the journey of humanity, the book and the actual journey, would permit us to design growth-enhancing policies that are country-specific, history-specific, that will be critical 
for the ability of humanity to flourish in the decades and the centuries to come. And let me illustrate it in a very simple fashion. So when the World Bank is preaching to less developed societies, suggesting policies that can mitigate uh, poverty and inequality, they naturally emphasize fertility control and education. But when they emphasize education, it is basically years of education. Let's assure that the population is more educated than otherwise. And this is a wonderful policy, but it's deficient in the sense that what we learn is that we need to go beyond it and to design a curriculum that will permit each society to deal with its historical hurdles. So let me give you an example. Suppose that we take a very diverse society. In a diverse society, part of the difficulty is the issue of social cohesiveness and tolerance. So naturally, we would like the education system from a very early stage to target these particular elements. Naturally, we have limited resources, and we would like to target these particular elements in diverse societies. But if we focus, on the other hand, in a on a very homogeneous society, this will be a waste of resources. In fact, what we need in this society is to emphasize pluralism, to emphasize thinking outside of the box, to emphasize how to challenge the status quo. Or if you think about cultural traits that we, uh, that we discussed earlier. As we said, cultural traits largely emerge due to adaptation to the geographical surrounding. So suppose that we have some society that resided historically in a place that was not conducive for agricultural investment and did not induce people to plant and harvest. And as a result of it, those individuals historically did not learn how to delay gratification. Then again, the curriculum should focus on how to foster future-oriented mindset, how to foster the ability to delay gratification. We do it in, in the contemporary society by, by, uh, by either forcing or inducing our children to, uh, to, um, to learn how to use an instrument where naturally the return is sufficiently large and this is induces a long-term orientation. And we can do it in different forms, but again, this is education policy that will be based on the history of the place. Naturally, if you live in a place where future-oriented mindset was part of the heritage of the place, this will be a waste of resources. But think about gender equality. As we said earlier, there are certain regions of the world in which plow was used relatively early due to the suitability of the land for the use of the plow. And this ultimately generated the division of labor where men were engaged in agricultural uh, production due to the physiological advantage in men in, in carrying these heavy plows. Now, in this type of societies, focusing on gender equality will be instrumental. So perhaps surprisingly, the journey of humanity, the book and the reality, is basically suggesting to us that progressive policies such as gender equality, tolerance, and diversity hold the key for human prosperity. So typically when we think about progressive policies, we think about them in the context of our moral values. And I'm suggesting here that in this particular instant, in fact, the two coincide. Namely, those traits or those uh, elements, those policies that are uh, progressive and they're morally uh, uh, morally based are the ones that are uh, instrumental for the prosperity of nations across the globe. Thank you very much. We'll have some time for questions. I don't know if anybody has any questions or comment they would like to make. I can start by reading, if not, one of the questions on the Zoom link. So, here. Uh, so I have here uh, a question by uh, Owen, and it says, "With the total knowledge of human, uh, when the total knowledge of human race increases, it takes longer time for one person to learn enough to reach the front line of research 
The average age of PhD graduates are 30s now and will be older in the future, but human lifespan is, does not increase as fast as knowledge explosion. For fields like physics, it's become already impossible for one person to understand the development of the whole field. Physicists today usually can only work on limited scope problems. What's Professor Scalor's perspective on the limit of humanity's technological development speed and, and the relation with a human body's inherent limit? Well, thank you very much. That's a fantastic question. And let me address it a little uh, uh, more broadly. But the question is more broadly, whether there are limits to growth. So many argue that in fact, uh, humanity is, is, uh, is residing at the moment on planet Earth. Resources are limited. And this, resources, this resource limitation is bound ultimately to restrict our ability to grow. And the way that I think about it is a little different. What we learn from human history is that many of the technologies that evolve in the course of human history could not have been anticipated decades earlier and certainly centuries earlier. And therefore, my conjecture, educated conjectures, not necessarily empirically based, is that in fact, what we will see in the course of human history is dramatic technological improvements that will allow us in some sense to overcome what we define as resource constraint for the foreseeable future. And this is related to the question that was asked here. Naturally, when we think about education and technological progress and uh, suggested, uh, um, I mean, uh, thousands of years ago, people could basically hold the world production possibility frontier in their hands, which is the plow, and any innovation implied that each individual could make a dent through the world production possibility frontier. Whereas today, naturally, we need to commit uh, perhaps 30 years of our time to reach the frontier and to make a dent. Now, I think that part of the advancement in technology that will occur in the course of uh, uh, the future will be in, in allowing us to compress knowledge, to learn how to basically transmit the necessary knowledge so as to reach uh, 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 the, the technological frontier. So naturally, uh, I mean, uh, we do not see in, in recent years uh, further and further increase in the number of years of education that are needed in order to reach the frontier. But if anything, I would expect that future technology will somehow uh, be involved in assuring that knowledge can be compressed, knowledge can be transmitted in, in a much more efficient fashion and as a result of it, despite the fact that life expectancy at the moment is not increasing, uh, we will be able to sustain technological progress. But beyond that, I think that the change in life expectancy is behind the corner. And again, it's something that is hard to anticipate. But think about it. In England, less than 200 years ago, life expectancy was 40 in England. Okay, And the first country to industrialize the most advanced society at the time, life expectancy is about 40. And uh, life expectancy doubled within 170 year period in England. So if I would have to conjecture, then we will see a dramatic increase in life expectancy and we will see a dramatic increase in the sort of in the effectiveness of life in a way that will not limit uh, technological progress in the, in the foreseeable future. Please. <clears throat> uh, Professor, I mean, you had this slide about the deep roots of, of development, if we can go back to it. Yes, um, just trying to apply this to modern history. I mean, in 1979, China had one of the lowest GDP per capita in the world. China had an amazing rise, and now it's the second or the first economy in the world, depending on how we measure it. How can we use this to explain the rise of China? For example, as an example, I mean. Right. So when I think, I mean, so that's an important question. How do we think about uh, the rise of Europe and now the convergence of China? Uh, so, uh, so the way that I would like you to think about it is the following. So naturally, if we think about the world, say, uh, in the year 1000, China is dominating the world. China is sufficiently cohesive, and as a result of it, it is technologically advanced and uh, at the same time is not suffering from internal conflict. So when we compare the European continent to 
to, um, to China, the European continent is, is characterized by cultural fluidity. One civilization is dominating in one period and another one in another period. We see great mobility. We see fragmentation in terms of nations and, and ethnic groups, which we don't see in China. So China is socially cohesive. China is, in fact, uh, uh, quite uh, homogeneous in, in, in a good sense at the time. And as a result of it, China is dominating the world. But then when industrialization is looming in the horizon, in fact, this, this lack of diversity in China becomes a huge liability in the sense that this homogenization is ultimately preventing the implementation of advanced technologies, the adaptability to the new technological environment. China is imposing on itself uh, geographical isolation is less subjected to, to technologies that are emerging in the frontier and are remaining behind. And consequently, we see that the culturally fluid continent, Europe, is taking off first, and this is associated with the rise of Europe. And then when we think about China in today's world, actually at a certain point, there is a decision on the part of the, uh, of, uh, the uh, elite in China that in fact, one can combine autocracy and uh, sort of Western type uh, style uh, uh, economic systems. And when this happens, then again, the cohesiveness of the Chinese society is very handy because again, they can produce very effectively given the fact that many of these technologies were, uh, were brought from, uh, from a distance. But again, if I would have to make predictions about how China will evolve, if there will be another technological shift, then again, China will lag behind due to this homogeneity or, and other societies that are more diverse will take off first. So we have uh, Mark Sanders here and who, uh, who's asking, the fact that no crisis has yet been able to stop the march of humanity is no guarantee at all that impending crisis will not do in the future. We would not be talking about the issue if, uh, uh, of Ukraine if such crisis had not emerged or developed. If the crisis spirals into nuclear conflict, we would see a crisis that threatens relentless march of civilization. Climate change has the same potential. We have, for the first time in history, achieved the level of sophistication that can stop the march that got us there. Uh, can our institutions and cultural evolution move us away from this type of crisis onto a more sustainable path in time? So what was the question I could? The question is if our institutions and cultural evolution can move us away from potential crises such as nuclear annihilation or climate change. Yeah, so, so as, I, as I argue throughout, I mean, when we think about uh, the process of development and we think about the fundamental ways of change, they're interacting with these important forces. Some of them are institutional and cultural. And uh, as I suggested, these are precisely the institutions that, will, that, uh, that could generate the proper incentives for scientists to develop certain technologies that will overcome potential uh, catastrophes in the context of climate. And this is, again, the power of innovation that is emerging in the context of the past, uh, uh, of the past few centuries. And at the same time, uh, institutions can certainly generate uh, some, uh, some limits uh, to the power of autocrats and ultimately for the capricious behavior that we see in, 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 in the context of Russia and Ukraine at the moment. Okay, we have one last question here. Thank you, Professor, again, for a really fantastic uh, perspective that you shared today. I guess my question is similar to the one on China, which is trying to bring the framework to like a contemporary perspective. And I'm curious, um, you know, if there's any additional cases of today's societies that you think have really identified uh, the challenges that you've described today and are making you maybe optimistic in terms of the strategies that you're pursuing in you know, solving these deeper causes. Are there any countries that you think have somehow identified, uh, sorry, I was speaking too far away. Um, were you able to hear most of that or, or no? I'm afraid, so if you can repeat it. it yeah, so in, in synthesis, um, talking about cases today, I'm curious as to whether there are in other countries nowadays that make you optimistic in terms of their growth prospects because they have adequately identified the real deeper causes of their lack of development 
and are really focusing on the deeper causes that some of what you've described today. So are there any other contemporary cases that you think make you optimistic? That's a very good question. And, uh, and again, I, I think that when we think about policymakers and policies in general, they typically tend to lag behind the, the frontier of research. And I think that this is not an exception. And in this respect, I think that we are still uh, in the process of uh, one policy that fits all societies, one type of institutions, one type of cultural traits, regardless of the history that is specific to the evolution of each individual country. So I think that we see some realization. I remember a few, few years back, I, uh, I lectured to, uh, um, to a forum of uh, the Korean government, uh, and I spoke about issues related to diversity, and they were very receptive to it. And to a large extent, they are considering it uh, quite, uh, uh, quite intensely. But do I see these policies being implemented in, in a significant fashion? Not yet. But as I said, again, if I learn from history, it appears that policymakers will adopt this type of policies in, in the near future, but not in a pronounced way at the moment. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Galor. Um, I wanted to ask about like the like lately that globalization, ma migratory flows have changed a little bit the distribution of like diversity among like places in the world. And I just wanted to ask, have you seen evidence that places that have been like, that accepted more migrants and I mean, at the end, like taking a little bit like being more accepted to, or, or in the other way, if people or, or uh, countries that were too like, too plural, like not accepting a lot of migrants, is that helping them to grow better or to develop better institutions? Certainly, if we think about it in the context of uh, sort of the past 500 years, so uh, I think that the prosperity of the United States is largely due to the, the fact that the diversity was created here in some sense uh, out of the blue, in the sense that the initial population in the, in the place was relatively homogeneous and ultimately diversity was introduced by different migratory streams from different corners of the world. And as I told you empirically, it appears that there was a shift in the optimal level of diversity from the one that existed in the year 1500 to the one that exists today, namely the level of diversity conducive to development moved into societies that are significantly more diverse like the United States. So, if we think about immigration policy in this context, I, I can certainly, I mean, so naturally when we think about immigration, part of the difficulty is that it takes migrants a certain period of time to, uh, to be assimilated, but the long run benefits based on human history are pronounced. And, uh, and as I see, we see them. We see them in the sense that the societies that are more prosperous, say in Latin America, Brazil, Etc. A society that tend to be much more homogeneous than society, much more heterogeneous than a society like the Bolivian one or uh, the Peruvian one. Well, I wanted to thank. Uh, since we ran out of time, I wanted to thank Professor Galor for his wonderful presentation, and I wanted to thank every one of you for attending today's events. Please, uh, you can go to Harvard Coop or the Harvard Bookstore online and purchase a. Uh, Professor Galore's book and uh, get to know the, the entire argument over the entire book. And again, thank you so much for the presentation. I hope to see you in the next event.